All right, all right, all right. Here we have it, children. It's another glorious, glorious Wednesday. And you know what time it is, so I know all of you got your cuppers and things together because, babies, it is time to dish tea, and you are dishing tea, ha, with Big Meats. Thank you all for your love and your support, and thank you for believing in what it is that dishing tea is all about. Uh, hello, all of my tea sippers out there. If you're listening by computer and you wish to chime in, want to call or whatever, I encourage you to dial 347-205-9183. Again, 347-205-9183. If you're online or whatever, and you're in the com- uh, you're on the computer. Uh, please make sure you go over to the tea room and chat over there in the tea room. It's open. Um, yes, come on over there and chat responsibly, honeys. I don't want you guys throwing things at your computers and all of that. It's okay to disagree. Just don't be disagreeable, okay? So uh, that there is what makes the world go round. Differences of opinion. So keep that in mind, and uh, we can continue to prosper and move forward, okay? Let me say my disclaimer to you all right now. The dec- the, the, the disclaimer. Disclaimer is, this show is for mature audiences, and the language and or subject matters are not appropriate for children or anyone who is not mature to handle the subject matters. Your listening discretion is advised. Again, your listening discretion is advised. Today's show, my darlings, I got a, I, we got a double dose of tea for you, honey, a double dose. It's called Stranded, where well, you better run to the ark, honey, Okay. <laughs> I have two guests that's going to come on, and I'll introduce them um, momentarily. However, I want you guys to know this is going to be a fun-filled show. So um, just be sure that if you have your questions, comments, or concerns, again, the telephone number is 347-205-9183. Let me do a shout-out to all of my sponsors, and thank you all for supporting Dishing Tea. We have Trade Day Management and PR Firm. At Trade Day, enjoy a touch of Southern hospitality with a universal appeal. For all of your public relations and entertainment management needs, contact Travion Davenport at 678-523-3088. Again, 678-523-3088. Or email her at traydaypr at gmail.com. Again, trayday, T-R-E-A-D-A-Y, P-R, at gmail.com. Thanks, Trey. Also, Pharaoh's Treasure Box. Fine art, unique jewelry, and sensational 3D silk floral arrangements. Creations by TAPS. For all of your decorative needs, contact Pharaoh's Treasure Box at 248-688-5178 or 5179. Again, 248-688-5178 or 5179. Or you can email at Pharaoh's Treasure, uh, Pharaoh's Treasure Box at Comcast.net. Pharaoh's Treasure Box at Comcast.net. Thank you, Pharaoh's Treasure Box. Also, Parisian Wine Productions, music to lighten your spirits and lift your souls. Specializing in gospel and inspirational house dance tracks. For all of your Christian setting and you need that nice little Christian gospel house track, contact Paris Hairston. He's the CEO at 347 347- Four zero six seven seven three four three four seven four zero six seven seven three four, or you can email Paris at Paris four two two six eight at yahoo dot com. Again, Paris four two two six eight at yahoo dot com. Thanks, Paris. C Train Productions. You are aboard the right train for all of your entertainment needs with C Train Productions. Omar Casserly is the CEO and founder. For all of your casting, producing, and production needs, contact Omar at www.ctrainproductions.com. Again, www.ctrainproductions.com. Thanks, Omar. Life Fellowship of Christ Ministries, L-I-F-E, Live in Freedom Everywhere. Reverend James Coleman is the leader and founder of the Ecumenical Social Justice Ministry, brought forth to free the oppressed and introducing a fresh approach to the Christ consciousness. Contact Reverend Coleman at mustardcole at yahoo.com. Again, mustardcole at yahoo.com. For information on services and any of his uh, Christian gatherings, you can contact him at 
313-833-9278. Again, 313-833-9278. Thank you, Reverend Coleman. Also, Ichim Vidal Couture. High fashion with a luxurious twist. Step into the future with fresh, innovative couture. Designs by Miss Michi Duvall. For more information or for price quotes, contact Michi at 313-996-9807. Again, 313-996-9807. Thanks, Miss Michi. Big Brothers Network, the BBN, is a new online web magazine designed to show the world the class and style of the debonair man of size and his admirers. Launching its first edition this Memorial Weekend. For more information for advertising rates or things of that nature, contact Big Daddy Tony Brown at Tony at BigBrothersNetwork.com. That's Tony at B-I-G-B-R-O-T-H-A-S Network.com. Thank you, thank you, thank you to all of my sponsors. Also, a special announcement. We have uh, the Five Mo Artists Detroit presents an evening of art, jazz, and theater, Saturday, June 5th, 2010, at the Samaritan Center, 5555 Connor Avenue, Detroit, Michigan. Tickets for this event are $15 in advance at $20 at the door. Portions of the proceeds will benefit the Uplifting Communities Faith-Based Nonprofit Organization. For more information, contact Peter Jackson of Pharaoh's Treasure Box at 248-688-5178. Or 5179, okay? Now, I have another announcement that I will make uh, later on uh, from Trade Day Management and PR Firm. But right now, we're going to get into uh, this this um, interview here because time is among us. Like I said, we have a double header for you today. And uh, I want to make sure that everybody gets in and everybody has time to to uh, say their piece and promote what it is they need to promote and that you guys get to hear from them because y'all know I, talking is a hobby for me. <laughs> well, without any further ado, my first guest, my darlings, my first guest, he and I go back, ooh, let's see, 20-something years. Um, again, I, you know I've had folks on the show prior when I say La Trope des Arts, that was the name of our troop in high school, and he is one of the members who had come out of La Trope des Arts and has gone forth and played the Hollywood game very well, honey. You may know him uh, as the infamous crackhead from Minister to Society, but he's done much more than that, a lot of film and television, Lois and Clark and things like that, and most recently, you've seen him in The Flock with Richard Gere, and Claire Danes. However, he has now embarked on being a director and a writer and producer. And this weekend here in Atlanta, his very first film is a powerful, gripping documentary entitled Stranded in the Motor City. will debut here in Atlanta uh, for the Atlanta Film Festival. And he's going to be joining us uh, here in Atlanta to kick it off and to get the folks to understand what this is. But I want you to hear in his own words what the documentary is about. So without any further ado, I want you to welcome to Dishing Tea. This is my friend, my associate, my La Trope des Arts member. This is the one and only Mr. Dwayne Barnes. Hello there, my darling. What is up? What is up? <laughs> What up? It's been a long time, my brother. It's been a long time, and I'm so it's, proud of you. Oh, I well, thank you, and that's a mutual feeling, my darling. It's been a long time since we've talked and yes, heard each other's yes. voices. We've we've been in contact. We yes. just haven't heard each other's voices, and it's it's it's. I'm sitting over here. I'm tingling right now. So for those of y'all, y'all know how I get when I tingle. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Now, before we go any further, I want you to introduce Miss Tandy because I have her willing to come in on the conversation. So introduce her for us. Tandy Ambrose is a wonderful, dynamic actress. It's a wonderful, dynamic friend. You've seen her on Jackie's Back, and you've seen her on numerous a series, Abby, Brutally Normal. You've seen her in Ringmaster, and her credits are extensive. 
but she's also the only person in this documentary whose last name doesn't happen to be Barnes. She's playing wow, the voice. Okay. Yes, she's playing the voice of my daughter, Angela Wilson, and I wanted to find somebody who had heart and soul and passion and who I would trust with my heart, and I chose Tangie Ambrose to play the role of my mother in this film, and I choose her today to join me on Dishing Tea. Tansy Ambrose, what's up? All right, all right, right. all right, all right. Do you love it? Do you love it? (laughs) Yes, yes, yes. It was fantastic. Heaven, hi, everybody. Hey, baby girl, (laughs) what is up? What is your tea today? Thank you for joining us, and um, thank you for just having Dwayne's back, honey, because in the previews and in the promos when he was first putting this all together, he was giving you all kinds of kudos and praise for just being there and being that support system. And a lot of the personal uh-huh. pictures he had pasted up on Facebook and all of that, uh, particularly, especially recently when he just finished with his um, his his uh, Black Belt series and, and getting his belt, he praised yes. you for being yes. his support system. So let I me start with you love, with that. What does that I, mean for you? Mm-hmm. I love Dwayne Barnes so much. He... He's he's one of my very best friends. He's he's first of all, let me tell you this: when you played your opening that song, I'm gonna keep pushing. Does everybody know that that was Dwayne singing? That's the one. Uh, <laughs> say it, baby. I told you I had to start, honey. But go ahead. Yes, gave me chills just listening to it. I was listening and I was just saying, God, I thank you. He has such an anointing on his voice, on his acting, on his mind, on his life. He's So I'm honored that he has included me and loves me like he does because my man is bad. Dwayne is bad. And he, let me tell you this, the series that he named that I booked, guess who coached me on those series? Oh, Dwayne get Barnes. out of here. Say we it. Uh huh. <laughs> we were a team. Dig we it. Dig we it. We were a team. Yeah, so. Yeah, everybody so I'm needs honored. everybody needs a everybody needs a, a creative support system and Tangi, God has blessed me with Tangi to be my creative support system. And we just we're just road dogs for each other and I yep. appreciate her. Yeah, and that's why right. I wanted her to join us on this on this wonderful occasion to talk about Stranded in the Motor City that's making its debut at the Atlanta Film Festival this Saturday at 12.15. 12.15. Right. 12 and, and everybody be on time. Be, come at 12 o'clock because it's going to be packed, <laughs> and we want you to be able to get in, and we don't want you to miss anything. Nothing, no, you know what? You can't because right. if you miss if you miss a piece of it, it's going to throw you off the sequence because I've, I've been privileged to see an advanced copy of it, and I'm going to be there Saturday because I need to see you face-to-face, baby. Uh, oh, wow. But after, uh, after watching it and going through the roller coaster of emotions that I had with it, yes, th- yes. you know, Dwayne, what – how cathartic was that for you, first of all, to get so personal, you know, and particularly knowing the industry the way that you know it? How cathartic was that for you? It was the most uh, daunting experience that I've ever had to endure in my life, but it was worth it because I got a chance to not only heal myself but to heal the people that I love the most, my family members, and mm-hmm. to share – their hearts and their stories with the world to share stories that you know these people would never have an opportunity to have a voice in this world you know what I'm saying it's for me to break mm-hmm. free and move to California and to live my dreams and to be able to give back to my family but also give back to humanity it was it's just a, an awesome awesome experience so I'm just very I'm just excited I'm excited you know, something mm. that's inter- interesting, too, is I've seen the film a few times with audiences, mm-hmm. and not only did Dwayne allow his family to have a cleansing and Dwayne to have a cleansing, but people come, and they are actually freed also. People come, mm-hmm. and they see that, and they want to tell their story, things that they have been holding on, keeping hidden deep inside, got tumors and fibroids because they've been holding on to stuff, and they're able to let it go after seeing Stranded in the Motor City. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, the I story – go ahead. 
I was about to say, I just yeah, it's like when people come uh, truthful and from their hearts, it inspires other people to, to do the same. I mean, my family members just poured out the deep, dark secrets of their lives. And I just think it gives people the courage to do the same thing. And I feel like that's what we need more in this world. We need people to tell the truth because the truth is what's going to set you free. So, that's right. Exactly. Yeah. And see, that be, a lot of folks don't get what that means because we use it as such a cliche, the truth to set you free. But a lot of folks don't realize the power in being able to have that burden lifted off of oneself, to be able to feel light as a feather and to know that I can still hold my head up and to know that I'm going to be okay because I am okay. That's right. You know, that's right. And and a lot of a lot of that with with uh stranded in the motor city, it was gritty and it was so real. See, I'm from Detroit. Well, I, as I said, honey, we went to high school together. So mm-hmm. I know what that struggle is because in a lot of areas it mirrored my life. You wow. know. Wow. In a lot of areas, yes, because, you know, we have the family members. I, too, was from a single-parent household and understanding what that is. I'm the firstborn, so oh, right. I had a different approach because I knew what that was for responsibility and raising kids and, you know, this, that, and the other. So it, when when we talked about those family members and, this, you know, the the journey that the family members took, and how their lives were, and what shaped and formed their lives, and how it had an impact on you, and then you still love them and not wanting to pass judgment, that's a lot on somebody. Now, Dwayne, mm-hmm. um, coming into this, did you ever think that people would look at this and, and question your integrity with the family? Did you ever think that folks may say, okay, you're putting your family on blast, you should be embarrassed, you should, any of those kind of negative isms or whatever when approaching this film? Of course I thought that. I would be lying if I said I didn't. I thought it for uh, a long time. I shot back in 2006, and because I thought those things, I set it down for three years. Mm-hmm. Because I needed to go and do some work on myself. You brought up the martial arts. I needed to go strengthen myself. I went and took martial arts. I went and delved deeper into myself. And when I felt like I was strong enough to withstand people's judgments and criticisms, that's when I felt like it was time for me to bring it back out. And that's when I brought it back out and I began, I began the, the aspect of it. And once I finished it, I mean, I I don't really care. I don't, I'm, you know what I'm saying? I don't care oh, about what people it. think okay. about me. I don't care about what people think about my family. I care about helping somebody. If this if this film can touch one person's life, then it's not in vain. But it's already a person's life because it touched mine and it touched my mm-hmm. family members. So I hope it touched everybody's life. That's my intent. But, you know, I'm not really concerned about the naysayers. You know what I'm saying? You know what I want the naysayers to do? I I want the naysayers. I want the naysayers to do one thing. I just want them to come and see it. You know what I'm trying to say? If you see the (laughs) trailer and you want to do it, I still want you to come and see it. You know what I'm trying to say? Because I dig it, dig it. Yeah, so that's what I feel about that. Yes. Do that. I, I I love that. I love that. I love that. Because, see, we have, well, listen, Detroit is not for the weary heart, okay? And we we hear that a lot across the country, Chicago and, you know, South Central and, and, and all that. We hear that across the way about everybody's little urban communities. But coming from Detroit and really understanding, honey, we're in the Midwest. We got all four seasons in one day. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and you know, understanding the cold heartedness of what of what the mid of Midwest culture is. You know, West Coast and East Coast don't understand their cold heartedness. They could get vicious, but they don't understand the cold heartedness of what Midwest living mm-hmm. is. And mm-hmm. Detroit is is the capital of that cold heartedness. Because, see, we'll rob you, talk to you, tell you we robbed you, and dare you to say something about it, and then, and then want you to buy us a beer on top of it. So, 
So in understanding that, you know, the naysayers that may look at this, you know, will come out of a bag. And I'm glad that you said, you know, damn them, fuck them. I, you know, they are who they are. You know, that's what keeps the world rolling because without them, they would, you, you wouldn't understand the, the positive people in it. Yeah. And also so now let me – okay. go ahead. Go ahead. I'm about to say, if, yeah, you go operate, ahead. if you operate behind fear and wondering about what somebody is going to say about you, it's like that's not the, the 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 that's not the mentality of a person who's really trying to win. That's not the mentality of a great person. You know what I'm saying? Right. Martin Luther King wasn't concerned about those things, but you know what I'm saying? Gandhi and Mandela, they weren't concerned about what people thought about them, and that's what I'm trying to step in more and more in my life. There's some that's areas, right. you know, I'm still dealing with, but for the most part, it's the courage right. and the heart that my family showed by opening up their their hearts and their souls. It's kind of like, you know, it's like that's what we need in the world. That's what we need in the right. world. Somebody can say, oh, you're trying to exploit them. I'm like, so say what you want. Yeah, I'm trying to exploit them. I'm trying to exploit them to greatness. You know what I'm trying to say? I'm say trying to that. exploit everybody to greatness, you know? And I'm not going to – I don't want anybody to ever fear their stories. Never fear your story because my story is my story. Your story is your story. Don't fear right, it. Right, Share it. Right. Tell it. And you'll – you'll inspire other people to do the same thing. And that's what my goal right. was and that's is, right. stranded in the Motor City. That's and it's right. not being that's stranded right. in the Motor City. You can be stranded in Chicago, stranded in California. Baby, wait a minute. Just stranded, honey. Just stranded, stranded period. Stranded okay. in your mind. That's right. Because <laughs> and, the majority, which is where it all is, exactly. The majority of the time, it's, it's not the situation that the person is in that's keeping them stranded. It's the thoughts in their mind that's keeping them stranded. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, so, yes, mm-hmm. stranded everywhere. And this, this, this piece stayed on Dwayne's spirit. It stayed on him. Yes, it took him a long time. He had a lot of obstacles that kept coming up, even when he started. But it stayed on his mind, and not so that it could go all over the world, which is what is happening on its own. It's because he wanted his family to have this, this freedom, this, this opportunity to speak, you know, for them to be recorded in history and to bless other people. And when something is on you heavy like that, you mm-hmm. can't let the thoughts of other people stop you. So any of you out there that have a dream, if it's staying on you, that means that that baby needs to be birthed. You've got to push that baby out. Hey, those I agree. So, yeah. I agree. I, okay, I, I, because it becomes a passion. It becomes a passion, you know, and if it's on you like that, then it has to be, it, it, that there is what you are led to do and what you're driven to do, come hell or high water, you know. That's right. And one thing that's, good about, mm-hmm. one thing that's good about Stranded in the Motor City is there are a lot of, serious moments. There are a lot of serious moments, but there's some comedy. You will laugh. You will cry. You will think. You will go in. You will wish that you didn't go in because you want to hear more. You will want the other people to stop laughing or crying or whatever they're doing because you want to hear more. Dwayne has it so that every moment you're on the edge of your seat. For me. Yes, I will agree. Every single moment, you're like, well, wait a minute, what is it? Can I rewind? I want to hear that again. Oh, that was funny. Oh, she's hilarious. Oh, I never thought Baby, about it like that. Yes. When you yes. get with your cousin, when that yes. girl is in the car talking about something, okay, you got to hear this yes. slow, so it burns real slow. Yes. Baby, I yes. fell. Yes. I fell over. I said, okay, but see, yes. okay, we are not going to have a joint smoking one-on-one in the damn car as you yes. drive this. Yes. Okay, but. Yes. That's yes. a real moment. Do you know? I'm not, I'm not a smoker, well, per se. <laughs> anyway. Per se. Per se. Maybe However, a occasionally. Maybe a brownie. Uh, uh, right. Brownie. You know, I'm an occasional brownie, and you know. <laughs> but, <laughs> but that is so real. And I have been in several instances throughout high school and college, and even today, where folks are in the car, you know, Doing yeah. what they do. Here, we done learned how to pack the damn black and mild so that the police would think it's just a regular black and mild. Whether it's tobacco, <laughs> weed, tobacco. Okay, so when you, yes, honey, so I've been there. And that there is the connection, I think, that the, that the film uh, is realness because everybody knows that. Moments in there, everybody knows those moments. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They know yeah. the moment where the auntie coming up there at the airport, honey. 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. she's not yeah. looking necessarily her best, but she didn't give a damn about the folks. She coming to get her baby. My baby home. Hey. Fuck we the world. Yeah. Okay. Thing. That's, that's what made me, like, love. This movie made me love my family so much more because they didn't care. Like, I was a little more like, oh, they're going to be uncomfortable because I got these moments. And when I showed them the film, I thought they were going to be uncomfortable. They was like, show the truth. This is our truth. We don't care. I don't have teeth. I'm not putting on my teeth for, in a movie. I want the truth. And that's the thing that, um, that made me really have a, a, the greatest, utmost respect for my family. And I feel like mm-hmm. that's another thing that this movie gave to me. I think I might have said it earlier, but I want to keep on saying it. It's like sometimes mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you go with life. You feel, well, I felt so insecure about where I came from and what my family had been through and all that kind of stuff. But it's like this film made me just so appreciate them and myself and other people who are struggling. You know what I'm saying? When I see other families who are on drugs and going through stuff, I have such a compassion for them. And that's kind of what I want this film to do. I want people to start looking at the man on the street you know what I'm saying, trying to get yeah. money for crack or trying to, like, hustle. Up. I want you to start looking at them with more of a compassionate heart and saying, what is their story? What are they going, what, what are they going through? Yeah. What, you know what, mm-hmm. what is the root mm-hmm. cause yeah. of their suffering? Yeah. What is it about? And yeah. that's what I want to, I want this film to inspire that dialogue, you know? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Now, what I'm hearing in this, Mr. Mayhem, and that, what I'm hearing is a spiritual healing because everything is on the surface. You know, when we're dealing with humanity, a lot of it's so easy to to take and do a castaway, and it's so easy to just to throw away folks. And you know, back in the '70s when we were kids, you know, it was always about you forgot where you came from and you blah 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 blah. But what I'm hearing in this in in, in you speaking of the film and what I've noticed in the film is that this here was about a spiritual cleansing, not religious. It's about understanding who you are and understanding to tap into the source within. And that is what the recurring thing that I keep hearing with you is that you need to get spiritual with this to understand folks' plight because everybody yes. has a story to tell. Yes. That's right. Yes. Everybody has I a story agree. to tell. And what's unfortunate, even with movies, so often when we show um, – when we show certain characters, um, our people tend to complain because they don't even want to see us as we really are and can be sometimes. You know mm-hmm, what I'm saying? Mm-hmm, so, mm-hmm. So, so, so they fight it. And like you said, everybody has a story to tell, and we should let them tell it without judgment. Everybody has a spirit, a soul, and a special in their own way, and it's all a matter of perspective. So, yeah. And I totally, I totally agree. Like my first role in that movie, Menace in Society, I played a crackhead, and then you know, you know, um, the, the white people were saying, "Oh my God, what a great actor!" The black people yeah. were saying, "You know, oh that was so degrading. Oh that was just so." And most people didn't know that my mother was on crack. You know what I'm trying to yes. say? So it really okay. put me in a very precarious situation, and that's why I. Felt, well, I don't feel like my spirit felt that this movie needed to be told just so you can. I mean, yeah, it could be degrading on the outside, but if you really go and look on the inside, you'll have yes. a whole different perspective of that crackhead in Minnesota society or that crackhead on the street. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And sometimes we have, to, right. we have to put a mirror. We have to begin to look at ourselves so that we can change ourselves, you know? Mm. That's right. And a lot right. of us you know, don't want to do that because the sight of exactly. ourselves frightens us. But we can't. I mean, we got to stop that. We just have to stop that. We have to. Let me ask you something, and this is very powerful because this this too is in the film. How did it? How did you feel when your aunt was telling the story of your mother? And she felt that she she blamed herself because she said your mother was never a follower. But she wanted to be like me in some instance and got caught up in this world. And she broke down. What did that do to you as you were filming that? Man, I must say, this whole movie, from the whole pre-production filming it to the editing process to the watching the the people, the standing ovations at the screenings, it, it just breaks me down. Even to this day, it just breaks me down. It breaks me down emotionally. I mean, it's, it's, 
hmm, like we don't often get a chance to really find out about our parents or our forefathers. You know what I'm trying to say? We don't mm-hmm. get a chance. To, mm-hmm. I, and for a long time, I didn't think, I didn't even think my mother loved me because she was making choices that, you know, from my from my young perspective, it, it caused me to believe that she might have didn't love me. You know what I'm trying to say? Mm-hmm. But once I got a mm-hmm. chance to understand that she just made poor choices. You know, she was a, a, a genius. She graduated high school at 15. At 15. Still, mm-hmm. If you're in the wrong environment, you can make wrong choices. So she made wrong choices. So to hear my aunt say that, I mean, it just was, it's, it's, it's heartbreaking. I mean, I feel like the whole movie is heartbreaking for me personally, but I know I'm a, mo- I mean, I know I got a personal investment in it or whatever, but to hear mm-hmm. the other, the, um, the viewing audiences say the same thing. It just really kind of like validates it all because, mm-hmm. you know, it's all about humanity. It's, it's all about humanity yeah. is humanity, you know? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Now, Tangie, you, a, you are right the – go ahead. No, go ahead, Tangie. Go, go, go. No, I, 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 I wanted to say, Tangie, you being the voice of Dwayne's mom. Uh. Okay, yeah, take me through that emotional overload with you, Cause I'm, I'm, and I'm saying overload because I, I'm, I'm there, and I'm, oh, uh, I, oh uh, I'm welling up right now because I, 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 I can only, uh, as an actor, you know, we know uh, what we do to bring to a role, but here, you know, you were the voice for someone who couldn't voice what she needed to say. Uh, what was uh, that for you? Oh, my goodness, it gave me chills. It gave me chills. It was a lot of prayer beforehand because I really wanted to to, to do her justice. Um, I, you know, I, I had dreams about her. Dwayne and I talked about her a lot. I saw so much footage beforehand, so I, I feel I know her. I feel like she and I have a personal um, relationship, and I felt like she was cleansed. I felt like spirit was flying high at the end of this production. If it's possible, mm-hmm, I mm-hmm. feel like she she feels like my voice has been heard. Even if you notice, like, um, Dwayne went home right before she passed. Mm-hmm. And normally they would go in the room and, and they would be in the room with her and they would talk, but they wouldn't really talk to her. Dwayne right. talked to her. Dwayne told yes. her that I love you, Mama. I forgive you, Mom. I shouldn't be tell. I'll let you Wait. tell your own story. But he told Ooh. her all of that. And I felt like Ooh. that's what allowed her to leave. Even if you see that clip in the movie at the end, you will see I know. Head turned to, it turned to And she him. looked at him. Woo, yes, baby. Yes, yes, she yes. Lo- and so Bob. She oh. loved him. And, and, and so reading that letter and thinking about my baby boy, because I love Dwayne so much, I just felt like I could really understand where she was coming from. You know, it's like, yes. she's my star, baby. Because, yes, she made some choices, but God had a blessing in this. She didn't do it. Jesus, when he was up on the cross, he said, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Know not what they and do. So, okay. Yeah, and sometimes we have to do things in order for the greater good to come out in a different way. And so she, she, she did that. She blessed her family, and now her life is going to bless the world. Her life is going to bless everybody. Exactly. Everybody comes to me. And it gave me amazing to me. The thing that's amazing to me is T- Tangi Ambrose has an uncanny uh, resemblance to my mother, her spirit, her size, her mm-hmm. stature. Mm-hmm. Her, her, I mean, and, and it, it scares me even to this day that, you know, that I will be blessed to be in her friendship and for her I look at her I'm like she reminds me of my mother and I'm telling you nev- I never thought that I would be doing this documentary when I first met her and I never thought that she would be playing the voice of my mother so it almost feels like it's a whole like mystical spiritual alignment because it is yeah. because it is you know that yeah. was divine order because you needed to see your mom's spirit alive and well and because yeah. as a child you didn't feel what you thought was love, you got it in the form of tangy. Yeah. And it was reminiscent yeah. of your mom. See, good, see, see, that's so deep. Folks ain't going to even understand it because they think I'm going to come out of the bag. But that's They're so deep. Understand. That's They're just how divine. Exactly. They, they ain't going to get it, and I, and I know it. But that's just how 
the the cre- the infinite presence and that the infinite creator does with us. And yeah. that was all in divine order, child. That was in the cards. That was just in the cards. And it shows you that it's supposed to be. When I have those moments like this, it shows me it's supposed to be. You know? Exactly. I mean? And a lot of times exactly. when you have a dream and you have a passion, all you have to do is believe and let go and ride the wave. And along that, along that ride, you're going to have a lot of bumps, a lot of obstacles, a lot of hurdles. Like, for example, right now I'm in the hospital. Um, the matriarch of my family, one of the leads in the movie, who we follow her journey through the movie, my grandma, Shirley Banks, is hours away from dying right now. So Lord I might not be me. able to make it to the I might not be able to make it to the screening. You know what I'm trying to say? But mm-hmm. I'm not letting this stop me. I that's why I did this interview. I wanted Tandy to come and support me on this interview, but I'm not letting anything stop me from stop living my me. dream. That's right. And that's what I want to say to your right. listening audience. I want, don't let nothing stop you. And that might not be correct English, but I don't care. Don't let okay. I get that. <laughs> we can do, look, right. we can do that on Dick right. and T. He's saying we can keep it real. This is us having I said keep it real, honey. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So, I mean, that's what I'm learning throughout this whole process. There have been, I edited the film. I took two weeks and completely edited the film, edited, edited the film and the whole movie crashed, and I lost the whole project as far yeah. as what I edited. Oh. So yeah. I had to start over from scratch. Yeah. And I cried. I cried afterwards. And I'm like, what is going on? But I could allow that to stop me and say, well, you know what? It's not supposed to be. But my grandmother didn't raise no fool. If my grandmother had the fortitude to take care of my mother in that coma for 15 years, for 15 I knew I had the strength. Years. For 15 years, I had the strength to finish this movie. And I finished it, and here we are today. I'm in this hospital doing this interview. She's about to pass, but I'm going to keep moving forward. Well, you know, like that, I'm – Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, but no, say what – you feel like what now? I feel like that's what she wants because, you know what I'm trying to say? It's like, it, I mean, everything must change. I mean, life is impermanent. Nothing stays the same. And the more we accept that, the happier our lives can be. You know what I'm trying to say? And that's, another, exactly. that's the thing about this movie. A lot of people had a lot of heartbreaks and heartaches, and they allowed those things to stop them and prevent them from moving forward in their lives. And that's what stranded them. That's what the whole title was about, Stranded in a Motor City. It's about people mm-hmm. allowing pains and heartaches and heartbreaks to immobilize them. And I can't and do I that. If I'm, preach- if I'm preaching that, i got to teach it. i got to live it. So that's what I'm doing it. right now. Yeah. I think, I think that you um, videotaping your grandmother, because you got a lot of footage of her, you got a chance to get her story, interviewing your family, hearing your mother's story, I think that helped you to see or helped you to um, – to learn a different way to handle tough situations because mm-hmm. Dwayne of um, 1993 would be broke down, bent over, it would be over. Oh but Dwayne goodness. of 2010, yeah, Dwayne of two, I have, I have watched him, I have watched him, um, for lack of a better example, grow into a man, and he taught himself. I saw him go to school. I saw him take singing lessons, and 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 again the taekwondo and and the classes and the spiritual classes, and he reads everything. He has gone to college and paid the tuition in a different way, and mm-hmm. even even stranded in a motor city, and all of that is what helped him to sit here on the on the phone right now and say. My grandmother is hours away. We've been waiting. We, we, we took the tubes out at 4 o'clock p.m. yesterday. The doctor said that she would be gone, but she's still here. And we're believing, but we're accepting. And I think that's what gives him the power to say that because of this college that he has put himself through since you went to school with him umpteen years ago. Exactly, exactly. Okay, yeah. what you say, umpteen years ago. Oh, and you're umpteen. right, because the Dwayne that I knew back in school, oh, yeah, he'd have crumbled. Yeah. He would have crumbled yeah. because even at the time when when we were in school, and everything that's in the film was the living reality of that time. You know, mm-hmm. Dwayne has always been a very private person, and at the, and his older brothers went to school with us, the twins. 
So, you know, there was a lot of talk around the school because the twins, were they were always doing something. And, you know, him keeping it together, you know, between going to the Corlears and coming to drama class or whatever, that was his his escape to let it loose and to deal with emotions. But at the same time, you know, he wouldn't talk. But we saw him crumbling. So, you know, we scooped him up and put him in projects and got him to do monologues and everything so he knew how to channel that emotion. But after those little eight hours we had in school, when he went home, he still had the deal. So coming from that, then he he went and and went to go forge himself and said, I'm not going to let this stop me and had the fortitude to say, I have to be the one to represent for the family because they can't do it. And left yes. Detroit. Yes, yeah, and left you Detroit. Know, and then he, and then he started left. finding role models, people that he admired, and said, "I'm going to incorporate exactly. that. I want to. I want to know how to do that. How do you?" He started asking questions. I'm. I'm so proud of that man. I just. I'm just so proud of him. I'm sending you a hug right now, Dwayne. <laughs> Now you know. Let me go here with you, Dwayne, because as we said, the opening track that I play for the for the show is from your CD. Um, give us the titles. Uh, um, Dwayne? Where did he go? Is he still there? Did we lose the one? Um, no, nah, I think we did. I'm looking at him on his on his car. Maybe we, 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 may have, we may have lost him. But, you know, he did say he was at the hospital. Yeah. So maybe he had to go. Okay. Yeah. Uh, We're going to, here at Dishing Tea, and this is a personal shout out, we're going to hold him up. Oh, I I think I got him. I got him right back. Hold on. You hear me? Yeah, we got you. Okay, cool. We lost lost the call. I'm sorry. Okay, that's all right. um, I'm I'm going to say this here because, you know, I, I, I know that, uh, when we were in school, you know, we had this thing with with our with our uh, drama club, La Trope Desire, and there's a number of us who have forged our own way. You know, Dwayne, uh, myself, Nikki Gilbert from Brownstone, Peter Jackson, who uh, was was acting, and now he's an artist and things, and doing his own thing with uh, Pharaoh's Treasure Box and and his Five More Artist Show. Uh, Carla Johnson, who went on to become a supermodel. You know, um, Trey you know, we have Davenport. a number of Travion Trey Davenport. Davenport. Ah, Trey Day Management, exactly. Yeah. Uh, you know, producer and PR to the stars. So, you know, we have a number of us who come out of that same background mm-hmm. and forged our way. And I have to say to you that I'm, I'm very, very, very inspired by you, Dwayne, because with your CD project, Mm-hmm. Um. Yes, I, I'm very. I, I when I bought it, I said, "Okay, let me check it out." I, and of course, I bought. It, I said, "Well, this is Dwayne. You know, we're gonna support the project." <laughs> yada yada yada. You know, you know what I'm saying. And that's yeah, it. Hey, yeah, you know, yeah, I bought it because yeah. I know him. Okay, boom. Yeah, and you yeah. know, he got to stay. Yeah. But when I listen that and, and the track that I played, "The Sky Is the Limit," is one of my favorites. Mm-hmm. Uh, between that and "Beautiful Life," those are my two favorites off the off the uh, the yeah. CD. Uh, and I said, "Wow, you know." And and, and it, what it what it did for me was help me to understand your growth and mm-hmm. and how you have have taken a one eighty and have said, "Okay, you know, this is the direction now. This here, mm-hmm. this here, this here." Now we're taking all of that. How did you channel all that to your daughter? Because your daughter is also in the film. Mm-hmm. What was mm-hmm. that like as a parent? And you had to, you know, coming, you know, your background, and then now you, now you are the parent. What was that for you? Well, I really had to make fearless choices in terms of my daughter. I had to know that she was protected just as I was, because mm. um, when I when I had her, I decided like after a year and a half to move to L.A. to pursue my dreams, and me and. Her mother, we were still together, but she didn't really want to move to L.A., so I had to make a mm-hmm. choice. I, I could either stay in this situation, in this environment, and maybe succumb to the same things that my family, you know, 
went to, mm-hmm. or I had a choice of moving to L.A. to pursue my dreams, and I had to make that choice. Now, it might have not been a choice that was, you know, I don't know. Somebody could have judged the choice, but I felt like I had to listen to my soul's call. My soul's call was to go to L.A. and to live your dreams and not let anything stop you. Now, I was definitely a a parent. I wrote letters and money, did all that kind of stuff or whatever, and I felt like I've given her an example of greatness, and I felt like that CD, and I feel like that CD is another example that she can listen to that would inspire her to let her know what my heart is because that's my heart. The sky is the limit. I can have anything. I can do what I set my mind to do. You know what I'm saying? There's mm-hmm. nothing that can stop me. Mm-hmm. If I look at the world and see the beauty in it, then it will become beautiful. No matter how ugly some days are, my life is still beautiful. It's beautiful right now in the hospital with my grandmother moments away from passing. It's still beautiful. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's just a matter mm-hmm. of perspective. So I just hope that everything that I did. When she sees me on TV, I hope that it always just lets her know that if my daddy did it, I can do that. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. that's kind of exactly. the question. Yeah. Well, all righty there. Now, here, uh, tell us, Dwayne, because I want folks to be able to, to have access to the film outside of the film festivals that you've uh, currently um, been a part of, what is the next step for the film itself? Is it going into distribution? Will the folks be able to buy it? Talk to us. Well, the dream, the dream is for me to, uh, us to do this film festival and us to get a major distributor, if Tyler Perry and his people or whoever, and whoever come down and see it and love it and say, I want to take this all over the world. I want to do what we did with Precious and take it to the Oscars and change people's Dig lives. It. That's what my dream is, because I dream big, just like you. I dream big. We were you know taught that. Now, you know, we come from, we were taught that, baby. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I dream big. So that's what I'm going for, and that's what I'm focused on. That's why I haven't, like, started selling CDs and doing all that stuff. I'm I'm holding out for that big dream. I'm holding out for that big dream, because I'm not going to even say if it doesn't happen. I, so what my wish is is that it is in theaters all around the world. That's what my big dream is. So that's yeah, what I'll, yeah. I'll just say that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right. All right. All right. And then the, the, and your CD, uh, tell the folks where they can pick it up because it's still on CD Baby, right? Yes, they can pick it up on CD Babies or they can pick it up on iTunes, Dwayne Barnes, Soulful Motivation, Mind Medicine. Dwayne Barnes, Soulful Motivation, Mind Medicine on iTunes or CD Babies. It inspires you. And it re- I really listened to that CD the entire time I was doing the movie, too. So it inspired mm-hmm. me to complete one of the hardest things that I've ever had to do. So I know whatever you're going through in your life, it will inspire you to rise above whatever that thing is as That's well. That's right. That's right. And and That's let right. me say, I'm going to testify to that because after listening to it, and, and, and you know, one of the things I know about music is that music is God's universal language. And I always listen. I'm one, I, I, I can't, I have to have a hard copy because I read liner notes and all that kind of stuff. And I, and I take lyrical content very, very seriously. And mm-hmm. listening to this, Duane, you have been able to, I call it more so like it's a spiritual medicine, if you will, because it's, it's affirmation. Mm-hmm. And if right. folks are able to take it and just apply, the, you know, I, I, I run into this thing on Facebook where I tell folks, if you take these songs and say them to yourself mm. versus trying to say it to your boo or whatever, you know, That's you right. start to learn how to love yourself. All you know right. what I'm saying? I love it. I love it. And okay, one of the things that your, that your, uh, your soulful, uh, medicine does for me is that it keeps me in tune and it, and and it propels me. When you mm-hmm. listen to it, you get that that wind beneath the wings, if you will, to propel to say, okay, I can shoot for this, I can shoot for that. And I thank yes. you for that. I really thank, thank you. you for that. Thank you so much. My that medicine. was my intent. Oh, yeah. That was my intent. That was my intent. So I am so so happy that you're saying that to me. And I hope that yeah, it does the baby, same I'm telling thing. you, when I heard it. Because, like I said, I bought it because I said, okay, I know this. You know, oh, that's Dwayne. I know him. Okay. 
You know, you know how family do. Okay, he got a cutesy. Yeah. You know, we're doing a cutesy, cutesy little play. Oh, he got a little CD project. Okay. That's cute. Yeah, I know he used to sing with the Corleas and things. Okay. You know. <laughs> it's me. It's me. I gotta, I yeah, gotta, baby. I got to give it to you, though, because. I got to give it to you, though, because we buy them because they're family, but we don't often listen to it. So exactly. you had some, some love and respect for Dwayne, too, to actually play it. So, And what a blessing you got after you did, because I think I got some oh, God. cousin so-and-so and so-and-so that I might need to go home and listen to right now. Exactly. You know, and, and, and like I said, I'm, I'm real big on lyrical content. So I thought, you know, after listening to it, uh-huh. and then when, when, when you said that you were coming up with the film project, I thought this was the precursor to it, actually. And then oh. after looking at the film, I was like, wow, this is the soundtrack to it, if you will. And I was like, oh, my God. And I don't even you're, know you're, if you realize that genius. or not. You're because the, the, the we're going to get it. Wow, because... Dwayne. Dwayne. He's there. He probably got a bad spot. Hold on, give him a couple seconds because he's still with us. Okay. But yeah, I I had always thought that this was the 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 soundtrack to it, and and because the CD came first, and then Ah. I heard the buzz. Okay, we just lost him. Yeah, he did have a bad signal. Uh, The the um. The CD came first, and then I heard the buzz. Okay, he's he's doing this, and I'm working on this, and this, that, and the other. And I said, oh, okay. All right, I got him. Hold on. I'm back. Okay, I'm we back. got you. Yeah, yeah, I know. You're in the hospital. We know. The the, the signals get yeah. all crazy. Yeah. So, uh, but I've always thought that when it came first, I said, oh, okay. And then, like I said, as the film came, then it was like, oh, all right. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and then after watching it, I said, oh, this is the soundtrack to it. Wow, wow, that is incredible. I'm telling you. Yes. That's, that's, an, yeah. that's, again, one of those moments where you just like, okay, it's supposed to be because you're speaking exactly what's in my heart. So I know, again, this is in alignment, and this is what what it's supposed to be. So I, I appreciate you for that. Wow. Oh, well, yeah. well, do it, baby, because, see, you know, we've always said in school, and one of us make it, all of us does. And mm-hmm. between you and Nikki, you and Nikki had the two biggest names of all of us that came out of La Trope. So right now, it's like if you're there, then that means, okay, I'm on my way. Just hold my spot for me. You know how we do. Okay, we come and just save us a seat at the table. You know? Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, definitely. So Most with definitely. with that, yes, yes, yes. And I'm very I'm very I'm very happy that you were able to uh to, to live it. It's no longer a dream because it's the reality now. And yeah. so and now that you're in the reality, you become responsible for the reality and you push forth because one of the uh, – here's another thing about the movie that a lot of folks may not understand, and that is the under, one of the underlying messages is that our lives are not our own. They're always for someone else. Yeah. And now that yeah. we can see your family, and just as you said, them telling their stories is going to bless someone else, Mm-hmm. And that's what it is. And they may have never thought that, you know, oh, my life is just me. I'm just doing me. But to hear their stories and for them to be prepared for it is going to sit down and it's going to shake up something because of the place where it's coming from. And so many folks in a lot of inner cities, and particularly inner cities because they can identify with it quicker, but those who are mm-hmm. not from inner cities who understand it, are going to be able to see it, and they're going to be able to pick out, and just as you said, learn how to see people with a different eye and learn how to see themselves in a different light. So, yeah, you did your thing with this one. You did your thing. I told Nikki, I said, this was a very powerfully gripping story, very powerfully gripping. And I I, I tip my hat, my wig, my everything to you, honey, because (laughs) you did your thing. Thank you. You did your thing with this one. You did your thing with this one. That's the thing about you, man. I know you'll be honest. I know you're not just giving interview talk. You're talking from your heart, and that's the thing I appreciate most. 
And that's the thing I appreciate about Tansy. I know she's going to keep it real with me. And when you have real people around you, you're going to go farther. You're going to, you're going to, exactly. you're going to, you're going to excel. When you got real truthful people, somebody who can say, mm, not so much. And somebody can, or somebody who can have the courage to say, you know what? You did your thing. Because a lot of people are so much envy and jealous within the entertainment oh. industry, within the black yeah. community, just within the world. So to have people like you and, 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 and Tangi and Shelly and Kina and Ron, I got a lot, of, a, a lot of great supportive people well, around Kina me. Kina doing? I ain't talked to her in a minute. Uh, who doing? <laughs> Miss Kina, I haven't talked to her in a minute, honey. Yeah, well, you need to do an interview with her. She's doing absolutely fabulous. She's doing absolutely fabulous. She's going through a human revolution. She's transforming herself, and, you know, the world is going to be excited with what she has in store for them. That's right. Well, That's right. Well, listen, any time, any time you have anything that you need to push or want the folks to know about or anything of that nature, you always have a platform here as long as God gives me breath to do this. And I'm dishing tea with the children. You always have a platform here because this is this here is is it's it's more than just life. It is a movement. Yeah. And look, let's look at look at the timing. I'm finna get the I'm finna I'm finna knock your wig back because look at the timing of it. Okay, we're in an era where the power shift. The power that be has shifted. We have an African American skin president who's doing so much to where the world has to listen. The most powerful man in the world is African American skin. We have people like you who are also African American skin who are able to get out there and deliver messages of truth and higher learning and higher understanding all at the same time. So this here is a movement to get ready. I'm telling you, we have to brace ourselves because it's happening, and it's going to happen kind of quick. And, the, and those who ain't ready are going to fall by the wayside. Now, you know, Scripture says that he's going to separate the sheep from the goats. Now, you better understand, honey, that there was, was uh, a parable, honey, but get it, because folks are going to miss the message. And if you miss the message, baby, I feel sorry for you because you'll be lost in that wilderness. And you are one of the people with that message that's out there. And I have to commend you for that. Thank you so much, wow. Mike. I respectfully receive it. I respectfully receive it, and I need it. I need to hear that right now today. I need to hear that right now today more than anything because, I mean, I can let my grandmother pass knowing that I took the time that she gave me, and I'm running with it. And I'm going to use the strength that she showed me that, that I have inside me, and I'm going to change the world. I'm going to inspire well, the world. Well, here's the thing it. that I want you to take with you. And know this, because her work is done. Her work on this film was to show people the, the, the heart of a mom's love and what love will do, because love has no bounds. Mm -hmm. And to not give up on love simply because the doctor said that my daughter is going to be in this state. Fifteen years, she showed y'all, no, love means love. She done let go of a man. She done let go of everything else that was in the way because they said that this was crazy. Love is as love does. Now, her work is finished on this side so that you can bask in her strength and continue to live and spread her message of what a mom's love is. That there yeah. is for you because she taught you that. Now, you still got the legs and the voice and the power and the strength to take it to the next level because she passed the baton to you, baby. Yes, 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 yes. yes. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, yes. thank you. Yes, yep. yes, yes. So, yes, yes. so yes. with that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to realize, honey, remember this Saturday, April 17th, I want you to come down. It's at the Landmark Theater here in Atlanta, Georgia. This is at 12.15 is when it starts. So you need to be in the seat at 12 o'clock. There are no credits and there ain't no previews. And this, it's going to start at 12.15. And you need to be sitting in the seat because it's going to take you from the moment you see the plane, honey. <laughs> Lift off. That's right. So, yes. okay. Also, also <laughs> so I plane. need you there. Also, Go ahead. Um, Wednesday the 21st at 3 p.m. at the same place at um, the Landmark 
Theater is going to be playing April 21st at 3 p.m. at the Landmark. And then to see some Dwayne Barnes acting on April 22nd on CBS, I'll be on Mentalist guest starring. So go check All that right. out as well. Yeah. All right. All right. Right. <laughs> okay, now you better live. You better live. I All right, now it. with that, my darlings, I am going to say thank you for coming on to the show. Tangie, my darling, let me say thank you to you for holding holding Dwayne the way that you hold him, darling. Oh, thank okay. you. And for being that rock. And then on a personal note, Jackie's back is one of my top five favorites, honey. Ooh. That I I done I done push folks out and baby, listen, I done burned I done I have messed up three different v- VHS copies of it now. So I, I done found it. it on D V D. Yes, yes. So with that, my darling, I I I extend that same courtesy to you. As far as dishing tea is concerned, honey, if you have anything you need to promote or whatever and just need a voice and a platform Thank for you. it, dishing tea will let you do it with no hesitations at all. So I thank, thank you. you. I bless you guys for this. And now let let us move on so that the movement can continue and folks get the lesson yeah. and the message. Right. I love I love dishing tea, didn't you, Tandy? I do, too. <laughs> Thank I you, baby. Too. Listen, T was too. fun. I felt like I just had an emotional release. I felt like I'm about to go and just like you, you okay. just win. Thank you. Oh, so much. Well, okay. Thank oh, you. Exactly. well, darling, exactly. that's what it is. Yes, sir. <laughs> that's what it is, honey. Well, thank you so much, and thank, thank you for you. your time. You go up in there in the hospital room right now, and you just hold her hand, honey, and just take the baton. That's all you need I to do. I will. Because she knows. I will. She, knows, she already know it. So on that, thank you so much. We'll talk with you again soon. I will see you. If you happen to make it, fine. If not, we all understand. Our prayers are with you and the family, and we're going to hold you up. You hear? Thank you so thank much, you, man. Baby. Bye. All right, my darlings. Bye. You're doing Good a great night. Thing. Bye-bye. Oh, well, thank you, baby. <laughs> <laughs> ah, I love you too, Chugga. I love it. Okay. <laughs> All right then, my babies. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Oh, did you just love that? Did you love that, honey? It is absolutely wonderful. Oh, yes. Now I got to regroup. Oh, it's always so good to reminisce and things and. But when the message is real and when the message is out there, it is it's a beautiful thing, okay? It is a really, really beautiful thing uh, to know that folks are out there to do it and out there to tell it and out there to live it, out there to experience it. And all of us need to just jump on the bandwagon. You hear what I say? All of us need to jump on the bandwagon. <sighs> All right. Now, before I bring in my next guest, because I see my next guest has chimed on in, I'm going to spoof him as well, because this here was the song. Well, they played it on the the air when when the television show aired, but I'm told that on the the DVD version, it's a separate, it's a different song. But in any event, let's.
All right. I just love that, too. That was one of my favorite songs off that album. But anyway, <laughs> we're going to keep things moving right along. As I told you, children, honey, we got a double dose of tea for you. Okay, and right now, I want you to welcome, oh, this child here has really, 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 really given us the Dagaga, darling, uh, with his flair and how he developed the character Alex from Noah's Ark. Mr. Rodney Chester, honey, has been around and has been doing his thing for some time. A lot of you don't know he's been a dancer, a skilled trained dancer. He's an actor, and he's also a talent agency uh, owner. And we're going to get into what makes Rodney Chester tick and talk about those things. So without any further ado, my darlings, welcome to Dishing Tea. This is Mr. Rodney Chester. Hello there, my darling. How are you? Oh, how are you? Honey, I am everything, and everything is me. <laughs> oh, thank you so much for taking out your time to come on in with us and have a little fun with us and carry it on. So, whew, oh, that last segment, honey, has just, oh, taken me there, child. That was a, a very spiritual moment right there. So do forgive me if I seem a little winded. But <laughs> let's start here. Because, of course, you know, a lot of folks understand you, and uh, a lot of your notoriety has come from Noah's Ark. So let's start there with your Noah's Ark days. You know, how did Noah's Ark come into your consciousness? Well, I, um, I worked on Punk's, uh, Patrick Ian Polk's first film, mm -hmm. and um, we sort of struck up a friendship. I actually auditioned for Punk's as a, as a dancer, one of the uh, drag queens. And uh, Patrick and I struck up a friendship after that, and then we became friends and hanging out. And then he called me um, one day. We was at this event, and he says, Rodney, I'm going to do uh, a show, and I want you – I have a part that I'm going to write for you in the show. So I told him basically that I'm not an actor. You know, I've done a lot of theater stuff, but um, he says, no, you'll be fine. I want to bring your personality to the character and then work on the character and build the character. So um, I said, okay, and that's kind of how Alex came about, because I never auditioned. He just oh. sort of, uh, wrote the part for me, actually. So. Oh, now that's such an honor. Honey. How did you feel about that when he said, I'm going to write you a part specifically designed for you, because that's an actor's goal, a dream? Um, in the beginning, it was really, um, um, uh, to me, because we didn't know how far it would go and what the intentions of the show. He knew what the intentions mm -hmm going to be, but we didn't know how far and what, uh, you know, how big it was going to get. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, I mean, me thinking in the beginning, my main uh, uh, concentration really was on my company. But, you know, Patrick was like, well, let's do this and let's make it happen. And then I just put everything into it, and um, I believed in it. And when he first started giving me the script and letting me read stuff, you know, at the very, very beginning, it was, um, I just thought it was amazing. I thought it was going to be a very good thing for uh, for the gay community and then the heterosexual community. Dig it. Oh, dig that. So you said the company was first, that you were already working on your talent agency prior to. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Now, now what's the catalyst? Uh, behind the agency, because I, I thought it was the other way around. I thought that maybe you had, you know, you got bit by the bug and this, that, and the other. Then you, and then after learning, you said, okay, let me do this on my own. Wow, that's interesting. As a dancer, I was a dancer, obviously, uh, first through school and um, went to New York and then moved out to L.A. and danced in L.A. And then um, I was on tour, got hurt on tour, and um, I decided to work at an agency, the agency that I was with here in Los Angeles, um, basically, one thing led to another, and then I became an agent. I really loved it, and I sort of put the dancing on the back back burner and uh, mm -hmm. became an agent. And then all the dancers were telling me I should, you know, I should try to do my own thing. And then um, a young lady that I'm working with now, she was the main person that was telling me I should. I opened my agency, started my own thing, and uh, this is my fifth year this year. So I had the agency before. I, w I had really just opened when we started Noah's Ark, and so I had uh -huh. 
like a year when I started Noah's Ark. Oh, wow. So so now, here's it. Which do you prefer, being on the back end and, and, and finding the talent and helping to groom it, or do you like being on the front end of it and, and being the talent? Well, you know, the agency thing has always been my first love because I'm an entertainer first. And mm-hmm. uh, almost the acting thing just sort of came about, which, um, you know, which I love, but I really love, you know, the work that I do here as far as, Helping kids, these kids come in, they get motivated, and they want to, you know, everybody comes to L.A. and they want to be an actor, dancer, singer. Right. <laughs> um, right. Uh, my main focus was a lot of helping those kids and try to um, uh, help them with their goals to be the best that they can be in this business. So with me starting out being a dancer and working with dan- now my agency, I rep dancers, choreographers, we have a print division, and then I also uh, do commercial actors and actresses. Oh, dig that. Oh, dig that. Okay. You know, that's interesting because I've never heard of, a, of, of an agency that was tailor-made to dancers. You know, I knew there was a division, but I never saw or heard of an agency that was tailor-made to dancers. I, wow, that's your niche. That's what uh, – okay. Well, that's why right. uh, – you're going to have to come on down and uh, do a little step two, five, six, seven, eight. <laughs> Honey, look. Okay, now listen. I'm a move weller. I'm not necessarily a dancer. Okay, and then I don't have my stretch anymore. I used to do a 6 o'clock, honey, like nobody's business, but hell, now I think it's 3.15. But, <laughs> but, geez, look, but like, it, it, I'm at 6.02 now. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay, now listen. Now you said that, okay, you started off uh, uh, and you, you were auditioning for a dancer with punks, which I have not seen. I'm waiting on him to release that uh, on DVD somewhere. I'll but you said you. Oh, love. Oh, darling. Oh, please do. Please do, because everybody's ratting and raving over Rockwood Dunbar and this thing, honey. And I, I've got to see this for this, this infamous kiss that he does with somebody. So, uh, but anyway, so you said you, were, you, you went and auditioned as a dancer and as for one of the drag queens, and then we know that you did drag uh, in Noah's Ark. So, uh, and, and I heard something in the streets that said that you did drag. And you, uh, is there any of that true, or, or was this just an extension of, uh, of, of you just pursuing this? No, I've, I've performed before. Actually, when we did Punk, because I did theater. See, what people don't know, I did Lacage, um, a tour of Lacage, which is not um, – I was a Cajel. I don't know if you know that theater background, but um, – Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Production. So I did drag for like uh, – I was on a tour for like five months, and we had to learn how to do our makeup, and I was a Cajel. So I learned how to do theater drag back then. So oh. uh, um, uh, we did a lot of performances for the show, to boost the show, uh, to promote punks. Then people started booking me as an entertainer to perform. So I did it. Okay. I what, what was, what, okay, now what name did you use, Sugar? Because my name is Samantha Stevens Divinity. <laughs> That's where Patrick got LaChance from, uh, uh, from the the drag name that we use, that's where you got it from in Noah's Ark. Oh, dig it, dig it, dig it. See, okay, that's what I'm talking about, right there. Oh, well, that's that's wonderful. I too have a theater background, um, so yes, I'm I'm familiar with you know the whole bus and truck and got to get on the road and learning makeup and hair and carrying on. Did you find a time-consuming child, you know, painting the face and doing some hair, putting on stockings and and a tuck and a this, that child? It's a mess. Honey. Did, did you find yourself becoming more comfortable with it, or was it a, was it a job? Well, at the time, it was just a job because I, I mm-hmm. it was something I had never done before um, because I was looking at it more on a theatrical base. It wasn't Dig like it. I was to, you know, perform – be a performer in drag. That was my first time really doing it, but it was all about theater, and that was what I was oh, doing. Dear. That was what I was geared to when I finished uh, college at Cookman. Um, that was my main goal, is to do theater, and that was the first production that I had auditioned for, 
and um, and I got it. So it was more on a theatrical base, but then uh-huh. I learned how to do all that. We had to because we had to do, um, you know, a, it was a bus and truck tour, so we had to do a Dig tour. It. So um, and I had to do twelve jump splits a night. So woo, there. Yeah. And you still got legs, okay, bitch? You okay? Love, honey. Tw- a night? Yeah, we had. Yeah, that was a part of the show. We had to do like a can can in the show. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. So I don't know. I mean, it's probably some research you have to do if you have never heard of it. But it, it's a great, great production show. Yes, I, I'm. I'm very familiar with Lacan's. I, I, I've never seen it on stage. And wow. Oh my. I didn't realize the dancer in that was that intricate. Oh. Okay, wow. That, oh, I'm, I'm just picturing that in my head. Damn. Okay, now, okay, now you're on the set. N- being new to the acting world, honey, how long did it take you to get your script memorized and, and to, to build your rhythm with the other players? Um, well, by me never um, actually learning, I had to kind of figure out myself how am I going to, learn the script because see what people don't understand is when you're doing that the acting thing you have to know your part you kind of have to mm-hmm. know the actors everybody else's mm-hmm. well and you have to perform it so there's a lot of aspects in doing it but what helped me because i had never well we had an acting coach the second season and that sort of helped us a lot but i thought of it i learned my lines is like i learned dance because in dance, I was a very quick study, so oh, good. I took my lines as counts of dance, and that's what helped me learn my lines, basically, because I had to really play because I, I mean I'm not an idiot, I'm not dumb, so I'm smart. I know how to memorize stuff, but still, right, being in that world of knowing how to act and act lines, knowing your scenes, knowing when to come in. And, uh, and and execute your lines and all that kind of stuff, it took me to another level. So I had to figure out for Rodney, how can I learn this? At, because on the set, when you're doing the scenes, if you don't know your lines, it's horrible. Because everybody exactly. You, oh, yeah. Everybody look at you like, okay, come on. So you really right. doing and know it. By me never doing it, we all were really kind of green when we started the show, really. Um, but that's how I learned my stuff. I just thought of it as dance. And I sort of moved in the direction of, okay, if this is a, a line, you have to you have to mark it out as you're doing steps. It sounds kind of weird, but that's that's what no. But I, I got it. I got it. I, I, yes, I, I, I'm I'm picking up the rhythm on that. Okay, I got you. I got you. I got you. Yeah. Wow. That that's that, that, wow. That's new for me. I'm, that's the first time I've heard a dancer say that. I've learned it as if it was, you know, we, we're counting out steps. Okay, one, two, and three, and four. All right, got it. Not so okay. much. Not so much physically as counting out the steps, but I had to figure out study wise and format wise. Mhm, mhm. A dancer, because cool. everything is a dancer is formatted, even though you're doing steps and you're learning steps, right. but it's still a, a path that you have to t- take, like. A beginning, a middle, and an end, and that's what I had to do. And an end, mm-hmm. So, right. Oh, wow. All right, all right. Now, because this role was written for you, you know, that gave you leeway to 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 create Alex a little bit more unorthodox, uh, if you will, than, any, than, than say, uh, how Noah may have been developed because it was a little bit more structured with Noah. Uh, how did you answer the critics that, that may have said that Alex was a little too over the top and too flamboyant or too loud or too whatever? Well, I mean, did they say that? <laughs> I've heard, well, I'm from Detroit, and, and being from Detroit and Atlanta, you know, in some of the circles that I've traveled, yeah. I mean, you know, first of all, I... I really never looked at anything good or bad, to be honest with you. I just, uh-huh. character, I played the character. Um, I was given material. They really let me more than anybody, I think, ad-lib a lot um, with the character because, Alex, the character was supposed to be big. And you ha- mm-hmm. I think you had to have that 
for me to be the uh, the comedic type character, you had to be big. And 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 to, to be honest with you, when I did the show when I started, I was always very much like, this is I'm, I feel like I'm so wild. You know, it was just so intense to me because it was so crazy. But they was like, no, we love it. Keep it up more. They kept saying. I remember Patrick kept telling me, Rodney, more, more, more. So. It was their idea that the character be as big as it was. They wanted it to be big and over the top. That was the main thing. Really? Because the okay. was sort of like the mama bear of the group, the mother type person. Yeah. So that character in anybody is always like a bigger type person. But Yeah, bigger than life. Mm-hmm. Also to make sure that I had a message behind it, regardless of whatever. So by me being all loud and crazy and all that, I still – had my clinic, and it was a very, very point to that. And I was in right. a great relationship, too. So, you know. Okay, now, so you touched on something where I'm going. Because, darling, the relationship between Alex and Trey was so remarkably beautiful. This is a twofold question. The first one y'all were the two biggest children on the set, and you really ain't that big, <laughs> okay? But do you believe that the show helped uh, with 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 uh, visualizing and having the big boy community vocalize? Because a lot of times when we see uh, films that are LGBT uh, uh, designed, it's always the cute little pretty boys. You know, you got Noah, you got uh, all the cutesy, cutesy little children, honey. Okay, Ricky and carrying on. And that is what we know of the community. But Alex and Trey, you know, they were they were big turns. So, did you think that helped with that? Um, I have to say, I, to be honest, I really didn't think of it like that because mm-hmm. in the beginning, I just remember that um, Patrick telling me that he didn't. Honestly, in the beginning, when we first started doing Noah's Ark. I was working out a lot, and um, you know, because I was always an in shape guy, and working out the gym. Uh-huh. Actually, told me to stop working out. When I say stop working out, he just told me he didn't want everybody to be buff and built. And that's uh-huh. something that people might not know, but that's what he did. He told me that he said he wanted it to be relatable to, um, you know, a lot of people, all shapes and sizes and everything. And at first, I didn't get it, but then I respected him in the end because I got it. And I knew that me being an actor, that it was okay. So I uh-huh. moved in that direction to not necessarily stop working out, but I just sort of, you know, I just maintained what they wanted me to do for the show and um, and um, uh, to understand that it would help a lot of people in a lot of different ways. So that's why mm-hmm. I did that. And it made sense because realistically, if you have four friends that hang out, everybody ain't going to be buffed and all <laughs> That you know, it's just not realistic. So that's why he wanted it to be a little bit more, you know, mixed up a little bit. And um, so I think in the end, it, it mm-hmm. you know, I think it did. It, it, it made a point to it, and I understood because you know, when you're an actor and you're doing stuff, you have to uh, understand the motivation for the full picture. So that's okay. All. Well, I would say, honey, it, it did my heart proud because, see, I'm one of the big boys, honey. I'm 6'4", and I got a little piece. I'm over 350 pounds. So, and I, and I was going to send in a photo and resume because I wanted to come on the show as either one of y'all's cousins, either you or Trey's gay cousin or something, just so that he could have a big boy, on, a bigger boy on the set and then to have the dichotomy because Trey was the big old bodybuilder and and all of that. So that was always my my uh, vision as I was a, a fan of the show to see it become more diverse as far as our sizes were concerned. And you two have become, you know, more like a hero for the big boy community because you were a, a big boys of color on film finally with 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 something that we can latch on to. So I was I had always wondered about that, you know, um, Greg is- uh, with the show. Greg is six three and I'm almost six two, so mm-hmm. you know physically, yeah, we we definitely were the the uh, the bigger guys, yeah, for sure. Mhm, mhm. Okay, now you know the the show ended up tackling a lot 
of the social issues that the LGBT community deal with. You know, y'all dealt with gay bashing. When when Noah got jumped and carried on, you dealt with uh, the whole uh, gay parenting. When when Alex and Trey took on uh, the little girl and and was ready to adopt uh, the gay marriage thing to this, that, and the other, was that strategic or was that just, um, you know, just because it's a part of the community? Well, I mean, I think the one thing what I can say honestly is, and what I would love for everyone to know is so amazing because Patrick is an amazing writer. He really mm-hmm. is. And when we when we started Noah's Ark, there was so many issues and things that they wanted to touch on, and he really felt like that was, you know, it was really something that needed to be addressed, and that was why it was done. And when you look back at it, I mean, it was amazing because it happened. And I think that it showed that in the show, this is what's going on. Okay. Really, well, okay, really, dig I, it. I mean, I was glad that it was it was done because it just showed another aspect of the show and um, of, of Patrick's writing and and what he was where he was geared to and the certain topics that he would want to touch on. Uh huh. Okay. Okay. Now, with you being a dancer and everything, all of the, the choreography that you guys ended up doing on the show, did you choreograph those things? No. Actually, I represent, at my agency, I represent Frank Gatson, who is Beyonce's choreographer. Oh, dig it. Dig it. Yeah, I have a lot of high-profile clients. But anyway, he is uh, one of my top choreographers. And uh, uh-huh. he came in. I asked him um, if he would do it. And... um he came in on a very, very low pay, <laughs> but he did it just because he believed in it and, and stuff like that. And he, we learned that literally in, I think, because, see, that day we had to shoot as boys, and that night we uh-huh. had to drag stuff. So we learned that, like, one night after work, and then the next day we had to shoot it. Okay. Now, you know what? I'm going to get ready to give you a whole bunch of kudo points, Heffer, because, Miss Thing, you done just pulled a grand old stunt. And that is you being contracted and then subcontracted your own agency, and you done got all the money. I ain't mad at your ass for that. Now, that there is creative marketing. You get very, 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 very good kudo points for that. Good, 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 good points. Thank you for gaining Huh? Repeat that. <laughs> Honestly, seriously, with, with the whole situation with Frank coming in, this was just something with me believing in the project, working with Patrick from the beginning, and just knowing that I wanted to, to make it work as best as we could and um, uh, and helping with that, I brought Frank in, you know, and just Dig him. part of it, of, it, of us all working together and trying to make the best show that we can for what, you know, for whatever the budget was or whatever it was. And Frank mm-hmm. was for it because it was nowhere near what he usually gets paid, on, you know, on a day rate type thing. Right. It, mm-hmm. Because, you know, he did it really because, I mean, I think he did it because of me, but he also did it because he believed in it, and he wanted to be a Dig part it. of it. So. Well, that's important. Most of the time, that's what, most of us, when we want to put our name on something, it's because we believe in the project anyway, so... Yeah, wow, that is phenomenal. But you, but as a business person, you still get kudo points, honey. I love you for that. I love you for that. Okay. Now, uh, when the when the series ended and you had to transition from doing the series to now you guys had time off and then and then came the movie. You know, was that hard to adjust to get to to do it in that particular form for you, or did you think it was just the next wave? So um, at the time, we, none of the actors, none of us knew exactly where they were going to go, if we were going to do another mm-hmm. season or what. They decided to do a movie, so it, we said, okay. But if I'm not mistaken, I believe that there was a, a lot, a large time span from us finishing season two to doing the movie. So um, we had a lot of time there because uh, I guess yeah. what he was going to do with it, writing the movie and all that stuff like that. But by sheer genius, when we all came back together, it was just like clockwork. And I think that happens with a lot of shows when they go on hiatus or whatever they do. When you come back right. together, we just sort of, you know, all jail back. I remember us all being on the plane together. Everybody was reading their script on the plane. And, you know, we, when we got back into it, 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 we just got back into the groove right away. Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, all right. Now, 
you know, there was this whole big outcry. The public has been has been looking for Noah's Ark to come back. Noah's Ark for the black community, dear for the black community, LGBT. What? Um, uh, um, what's the other? I can't think, call the name of the show. Right, the Showtime show, the 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 big one. Uh, did for the other community. I can't call the name of the show right now. It escapes my mind right now. It'll come to me in a minute. Um, so if 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 the public's outcry for it to return uh, happens to to be answered, would you go back? Now, I, I have to be very careful with what I'm saying here because I don't know for sure, and I'm not sure what's okay. going on, but. I had heard that there's talks of them doing some other stuff, but to be honest with you, I don't know if all of us are going to be involved, and I just have to be honest. Interesting. Maybe I yeah. might get in trouble for saying it, but I, I feel like the fans need to know something. Um, what I what I was told that they're thinking about doing some type of spinoff, maybe, but they're not sure on. Mm-hmm. Um, what actors are going to be? Just put it this way: I have not been approached. Okay, dig it. Okay. All right. And then, too, also depends on – it's been so much time and everybody's availability could be different and whatever. So, you know, if those talks are true, you know, everybody may not be available. So, you know, it, it will be what it be when it gets there. So, all right. Okay. I mean, I would right. love to do more type things like that. But, you know, when the powers that be get involved and they have a, a, a way that they may want to go, I'm not sure. But what I've heard – as well as you guys, that they are thinking about doing something, but they have not reached out to me um, to invite me back to do anything. So I don't know. I mean, you know, it's just that I re- honestly, I don't know what's happening. But that's just what I heard. But I have not been contacted about anything yet. Right. Okay. Well, all right. Well, in between that downtime, you know, you guys have still remained a close friendship, correct? You guys are still bristers and, and things of that nature when you can, if time permits, or is it one of those, shall we see you at the next function when I can? No, actually, I mean, you know, it's it's so cliche, but honestly, we really all – actually, I represent uh, Daryl, who plays Noah. I rep- He's with my commercial department. So is the, oh, guy who, uh, the guy who plays Wade. I represent him for print. Mm-hmm. And um, – also, the guy who played um, the girl who played Brandy, Jania, I represent her in my commercial department. So, a lot of these people I represent with my company. See what I tell you. See, didn't I tell you? Ah! Points, 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 and more points again. I love that because uh, yeah. Professionally, I work with them, you know, in that acting world, but also. Well, I mean, I'm like their agent. I represent them for their uh, for the commercial stuff. For the exactly, it's a baby. Okay, that's a lovely business mind, baby. I ain't mad at you. I'm learning so much, and in, in just that little bit is killing me. Who? That's lovely. Hey, but you know what? But let me ask this. I can say how I represented all of them before Noah's Ark. Understand that as well. They all were dig it. Um. Jensen, yeah, I mean Jensen was with me before. Janelle was with me before. I, I, I'm not. I'm, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure about Daryl who plays Noah. I think we kind of crossed. Uh-huh. But yeah, but they mostly they was with me before I even did Noah's Ark. So um, maybe Noah's Ark. I knew Christian who plays Ricky. We danced. We did some dancing stuff together. Um, I knew Daryl a little bit. I had never met Doug at all. Uh huh. Uh huh. It was one of those kind of situations. Oh, get out. See, Miss, I'm t- baby, you and your your business savvy, honey, I'm going to have to really come and study you, honey, because I'm loving it. Because I mean, there's a lot that I'm hearing that I won't go into on the air because it's, it's tickling me. It is really tickling me. And I, and I love it. I love, I love it. Um, but let, let, let me go here because um, – uh, give us the name of your talent agency because we're hearing so many wonderful things of, and you're representing the folks and, 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 and this, that, and the other. Tell us the name of it and and uh, your mission statement. Um, well, my uh, agent is called uh, Trio Talent Agency, T-R-I-O Talent Agency. Um, you can um, go on my website. Well, actually, I'm re- 
refreshing my website right now, but it should probably be up hopefully by the top of next week again. Um, and uh, uh, I mean, you know what? what um, Chrissy, where, where's where's the copy of the mission statement? I don't have it on me right now, but we have. But I do have a mission statement. Um, I don't have mm-hmm. it in front of me right now, but um, um, that's it. I mean, I rep dancers, like I said, dancers, choreographers, uh, commercial actors and actresses, and uh, I do print models. Oh, dig that. Dig that. All right. Now, you know, well, now that, that, that everything is where you are as far as the show is concerned, uh, a lot of, do you still answer to folks when they call you Alex, or, or you know, are you are you forgiving with that, or, or do you accept it and then let them know, no, my name is Rodney, and that kind of thing? Let me go back. I got my mission statement. Can I can I tell you? Okay, go you ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, sure. Trio, uh, Trio Talent will provide superior talent representation by building long-term and professional rate relationships with clients by offering genuine client support, respected industry connections, and and recruiting efforts. We will provide and support the talent artistic endeavors, and we will maintain the highest amount of integrity in doing so. Well, do that. That's my mission statement. All right. I love that. Okay. So So now give us the website. People, if they call me Alex, look, that's all they know of me to call me is Alex. So I'm fine Uh with it. No, because that's the character that they uh, associate me with. I mean, I'm Rodney, mm-hmm. but um, believe it or not, though, a lot of people they they'll say um, they'll call me Rodney, but um, of course, uh-huh. uh, mostly they say Alex, Alex. You know, so it's, it's right. Okay. I don't mind. Now, even though you you were able to create Alex, how close are Rodney and Alex? Because they they you know how close are they, and what was their divide? Um. I think that, in all honesty, obviously a lot of it is me, but I also have mm-hmm. another side of myself because I'm a business owner, so I can't be like right. that all the time. You see what I'm saying? Exactly. Uh, you know, exactly. and I'm very, well, yeah. very serious when it comes to my business because mm-hmm. I am a business owner, so I have to be on top of it. So I would say that, of course, if the character was written for me, you know, and uh, Patrick let me do a lot of ad living and stuff like that, and um, so I would I have to be honest and say yes, a lot of it is me, but I also feel like I have a lot of the side of me as well, you know, because I can't uh-huh. be like that all the time doing what I do, because the show was exactly part of Rodney. My business and my company is another part. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. Basically, that's it. Well, cute. That well, I, that should be with everybody, but we all know we have some of those girls, honey, who are always over the top, you know, and don't know when to be business and when to when they're you know at play and when they're when they're you know pseudo whatever whatevers. But um, you have been very successful, and you're one of the very few celebrities who do this. And that is, you have been able to not be in tabloid or BS. Now, how have you managed to keep your personal life personal uh, and share what you would like to share versus everybody trying to find out who your baby daddy is and this, that, and extreme extremes? Well, you know, you, you know, I just feel, to be honest with you, with all due respects to anybody and how everybody lives their lives or whatever, I just feel like my personal life is my personal life. And what I bring to the screen or what I do or whatever, that's that. You know, um, I don't know. I mean, I just feel like I have to – I feel like I sometimes in a lot of ways I have to have something for, for Rodney, and that's what I do right. myself. That's all. I mean, it's not like it's an issue or it's a big deal or I'm trying to hide anything. It's not anything like that, but it's just – I've kind of honestly always been like that. I've always been a kind of sort of a private person when it comes to that. Really? Well, I ask that question to celebrities a lot because it fascinates me. You know, because the paparazzi is so brutal. And we always hear of those who are in scandals and this, that, and the other. And for those celebrities, like, I, I spoke with Stephanie Mills, and I asked her this question, and uh, 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 Tony Terry and Rodney Perry, I asked them all this question because you don't hear of them in those particular tabloids or whatever. So the secret to it, you know, I've always wanted to know what was their secret 
for not being out there. You know, paparazzi is everywhere. So what is it that you do to maintain, you know, just, you know, a personal life? Because it doesn't seem that that's at all possible. For those who succeed at that, I marvel. Yeah, right. I marvel. Yeah, I think I think you just have to just be who you are, you know, and just and just know that you have to separate it. And just know that you don't have to um, give any information out that you don't want to. People get trapped in that, and they think that they're like I like honestly, I did the Wendy Williams uh, show, and uh, uh-huh. everybody was really like, "Oh my God, I can't believe you're gonna go on there." But my thing was, I was fine, I was great because I looked at it like I knew what my purpose of going on there was. It was going to promote the show, so all that other mm-hmm. stuff was not important to me, and and and, and I only told her what I wanted her to know. So that's how I kind of look at it, you know, and it's really one of them kind of situations. And I think you you have to control it, you know, whatever that is. Now, now, oh, oh, okay, now here's the the thing. Now, that's you on your end. But what about the person on the other end, the person who may not have that same self-control? You know, who may want to collect on the the couple of coins or whatever. You know, so however y'all been able to manage that to keep the other person, you know, who who um, you know, from from going to the tabloids and keeping your name clean and this and that. I marvel at all of that because every it seems like this culture now is is motivated by the dollar. Well, yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, I, honestly, I, I I mean, I don't know. I just. I don't know if I'm, I don't wow. know. I just keep it okay, you know, And that's fair. That, that's fair. That is so fair. And that is so fair because I'm, I'm just, I marvel at that completely, especially with all these tell-all books. We got Tiger Woods. We got all these other children that's in the news going to rehab, going to this, that, and other. And, you know, for those who've been able to manage that, I so, yeah, I take my hat off to y'all because whatever it is, honey, you need to write a book on it and make some more money about it. <laughs> So <laughs> I have a caller okay. coming. Oh, thanks. I got somebody uh, in the in the uh, chat room. Pharaoh's treasure box. Hey, baby, in the chat room. Now put your talent agency up uh, for those who are interested. Go to the tea room, honey. www.triotalentagency.com for more information on uh, Rodney Chester's uh, talent agency. Okay. Now I have a caller that's coming in. Nine eight nine seven nine zero nine eight nine. Seven nine zero. Hello, baby. You're dishing tea with Big Meech, and here's Rodney Chester. Hey, darling. Hey, Meech. Oh, <laughs> hey, boo. Hey. <laughs> What's up? Um, well, it's a few things because you know I am a great, great, great big fan of this show. That's how I love your character. I really do love it, and I'm just so upset it's not on the air. But there's a few things I wanted to ask. One was because I saw the movie Ski Trip. I wanted to know. If that came before or after you guys started Noah's Art. And I, the second thing I wanted to know is, is there any other movies um, with the, all the characters or some of the characters that what was out also so that I could see those as well? Well, thank you for uh, calling in and being a fan. Um, well, as far as Ski Trip, I have nothing to do with that. Uh, Ski okay. Trip, uh, another director, Maurice Jamal, who is a very talented director. Um, so I'm not sure. Because what did you ask me about Ski Trip? Well, I was like, I know that's one of the movies with a lot of characters from Noah's Ark in it, so I wanted to know if that was before or after you, you guys started Noah's Ark, and if there are any more movies with the group of those characters, you guys in it, that I haven't seen so I can go check them out. Okay, well, none of us were in Ski Trip, but uh, th- we're not sure what they're doing with Noah's Ark yet. Okay. We're not sure if they're going to do more, if they're doing a spin. We're not sure what they're doing yet. So, But I'm sure as soon as they figure out, we're gonna, uh, they're going to let everyone everyone know. Okay. Now, you said you were in the movie Punk. Is that the only other one that's out? Sorry? You were in a movie called Punks. Is that a, a one, the only other movie that's out? Yes, I, I did Punks. Well, that's Patrick's movie. Uh, I did Punks with him and then uh, Noah's Ark. Okay. Yeah. And that's all I wanted to know. Thanks. Oh, well, all right. I'm, I'm well, gl- thank I'm you, my glad darling. You're, glad you're on the show, and thank you for coming on, because we, we all did want to know what was going on with the show, I'm sure. Okay. <laughs> and just for clarity, 
uh, one of the ski trip was a uh, Maurice Jamal's uh, predict, particular production, and it got lumped in. A lot of folks were confusing that with a lot of the the uh, uh, LGBT of color movies because it because of its theme. But no, that was a separate entity, and and the cast list there was different from what was in Noah's Ark. Because yeah, and I I'll get that over to you, honey, because you know I have it. Well, okay. I had it anyway. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. Thanks, darling. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Thank you. All right. Everybody else is listening, so thank you. So, yes, my darling. So now, what is it that you're doing currently? Now that, that Noah is, is, is over for the moment and, you know, with the possibility of it maybe coming back, but in the, in the meantime, you're still, you know, Rodney. So what is Rodney doing these days, and, and what can we expect to see Rodney do? Well, I'm um, well. You know, other than running my company, um, I I did. Well, this is in the works, but I did, um, and I'm going to announce it on your show first. Um, oh, I get an exclusive. I love it. I got a, a new HBO show uh, that's coming out, but it's still all in the uh, in the beginning stages. So, um, uh huh. Did get a part on a show. Called, it's called Players right now. That's the working title. Um, um, that's the newest thing that I have going on, uh, other than my company right now. Okay. Um, okay. Um, actually, actually, I'm doing. I'm getting ready to do. A, I'm doing a lot of events, obviously. You know, and if any of you guys ever want me to come out to uh, your cities to to host any events, you know, reach out to your promoters. But my uh, my next thing that I'm doing um, is I'm going to New York um, next week. Because I'm mm-hmm. going to be the um, commentary com- commentary uh, on a new film called uh, For Faith, For Love, Forever. It's a movie. It's like a documentary. Um, oh. He's the, uh, uh, the narrator of that. And um, so I'm excited about that. It's, it's going to be an amazing project. Uh, the director is uh, a young lady. Her name is Nefertiti. Um and this amazing thing. And then uh, I'm going to go to Philly Pride that weekend because I'm hosting an event. And then um, in October, I'm uh, going to be on a cruise, hosting a cruise, a black gay Oh, cruise. well, shit. So All I right. Need sure, <laughs> I need to make sure that you get um, – either we'll talk, D, and I'll give you all the information, but it's all on my fan page, uh, on my Facebook fan page, if you guys want to check out anything with me, yeah, please. Give, load it up. Honey, run, run it off. All of, all of your contact info that you want the folks to contact you or whatever. Facebook, and um, it's under, under – so go to search Rodney Chester. It says actor slash director, and that's my fan page. Please join my fan page. It keeps – um, you guys posted on what I'm doing, and the cruise. I'm really excited about that too because uh, it should be a really, really nice thing. It's going to be great. Oh, oh! See, so y'all gonna make me get on the boat because I, you know, I got this thing with gay cruises, and it started when I was younger when everybody was, uh, you know, heavily into bashing and things. And I said, child, there's too many gay folks on one boat. If they want to blow the boat up, they got they killing fifteen hundred thousand of us at the same time. And I have to get, I know that sounds so harsh and morbid, but I just have to work my way through that because, child, that, ugh. Well, if, yeah. well, if you decide that you want to go, D, you let me know, okay? We'll, we'll, we'll that sounds out. wonderful, honey, because, yes, I, ugh. Oh, please, please, I love um, the water so, anyway. Um, any fans of mine, please join my um, my Facebook fan page. And I'm also going to be, uh, on there pretty soon. I'm going to be doing like mugs and T-shirts that I'm going to be. Um, oh, really? Selling, yeah. I'm going to, with some of my sayings on there. Um, so I'm excited about that too. So I'm going to have some product um, soon, very soon. Oh, well, darling, yes, you keep me in the loop for real. Because I want to make, I, I want a mug, honey. I, I I have this thing for coffee mugs or whatever. Don't drink a lot of coffee anymore, but I just like the mugs. But anyway, well, I got that you. there is. Okay, okay, all right. And I got you right back. Well, lovely, honey, lovely. Now, is there anything else? Let me see. Did I cover everything? Because, you know, children want to sit up there and um, um, go through all these particular. Oh, you know what? Let me say this. Now, ask this. Because let's do a hypothetical here. Okay. Now, 
let's say that you had had the chance to go back and and you and Trey were 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 there and, and you guys are rebooted and, and, and it's up and running again. What would you like to see for the next wave for Alex and Trey? If you could put it out there and say, okay, if we come back on the air, this is what I want Alex and Trey to do. What would that be? You know, I love. First of all, I loved our relationship and what we, what we, you know, what we had. But you know, obviously, it left off with us um, having um, a baby. So I would mm-hmm. like to really, like, maybe touch more on that and like a family style um, with with him and I, and then maybe touch into, um, um, you know, certain subject of, of bringing his family members in. I mean, I had a lot, a lot of different ideas. It was so many areas that we could go with that with that character. Sure, I know. I'm telling you because I, I was I was sitting in the headshot. I wanted to be your because. We we the same skin tone, so I was I wanted to be either your cousin or his cousin coming in with my big old fat ass and say okay and 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 let have baby I want it on that show, but okay I digress. <laughs> the thing, the one thing but anywho, I, one thing I did was <laughs> art was that it um it was so far that that things could go with that show, and I think that it was mm-hmm. starting at and move the characters in a lot of different areas and maybe bring family members in. You know, in the movie, you know, they had their families come in, you know. So it was so many ways right. that things could have could have happened. But, you know, it's all up to the powers that be what they're going to do. So when it comes to exactly. that, sit back and wait. So that's kind of exactly. where we're at right now. You know, did you guys ever have any disagreements about the scripts? Because I know I did. I did not like how they wrote that damn uh, the ending of that affair with 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 the, the 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 child, honey, who was hitting on your husband. Alex was supposed to have knocked that bitch one good time, knock her one good time, just please. Me, but I guess they didn't something. want to promote you are violence. So on it, but let me tell you what. Let me tell you what happened. Let me tell you about that. And it's so interesting. I'm so glad you asked me. That is what I thought too. I thought I want to beat the hell out of him. Okay. But you know what? I, I said to Patrick, I was like, so why am I not, da, 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 you know? And he's like, Rodney, and when he broke it down to me, I got it. He said, okay. well, that is what people is going to expect. And what I'm trying to show is that your relationship is so strong and so tight that you don't have to go there because at the end of the day, he is going to do what he needs to do, and you guys are going to be together. So you don't have to go and get you know, get ugly and get fighting and stuff. It wasn't really about that. He wanted to show um, a totally different side because even though Alex was this this big, um, over-the-top type person, you would think that he would really give him a beatdown. Oh, oh, at least the sisters. If, if not Alex, honey, Ricky was supposed to took that bitch in the back and whoop her ass after he fucked her. Point blank. Okay. I said, okay, somebody go deal with this girl, honey, because that, that my nerve was just on edge with that. Because I said, Mm-mm, no, you don't have my husband put me out of my own house, bitch, over some bullshit. No, you were supposed to be knocked. But I think, but, I, mean, I think when it's all said and done, I think it, it, it would have been an Alex type person to really go there. And that's what I was thinking. But then right. explained it to me. I say, well, can I just push him or hug him? <laughs> I kind of did that. <laughs> okay. Can I push her or something? Okay. At least knock her in the wall. I ain't got to hit her. Just let me push her out the door or something. Uh, something. A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, child, that there was, I, I, I want to, to, let me say this publicly, and that is I want to thank you for, just allowing yourself to be yourself and for allowing the show uh, to take the route that it has. You know, not sure if we're going to get copycats and, and all of that to come after, but what we needed was the foundation to get started so that African-American LGBT programming can go forward and to move and to see us in all of our beauty and as you know, well. You know, Demetrius, I want to say, too, at the end of this, uh, you know, it was so important to me. I mean, you know, we heard, trust and believe, we heard everything. I mean, of course, we heard the good and the bad. We heard Mm -hmm. everything. But I think when it's all said and done, I think our goal was to do a good show, 
to make a, a positive light in mm-hmm. in the community and not have it so stereotypical. Exactly. And, and really just try to do good work. And a lot of people, you know, they didn't like it. They didn't think that it was it was it touched on it. But you know, it was it. I, like I always said, and I even told people in interviews, I was like, first of all, give the show a chance. And us as African Americans, we're so critical of each other anyway. And it's so important to me to really put that message out there that it was really about, you know, we were doing something that has never been done. You know, and sometimes exactly. they take, take time. And if you look back at any shows that they have now, they're never really that great the first or second season. You know, because you're developing the characters and you're, you know, and, and that's why I always try to instill in everybody and the fans and let them know the characters are still being developed. We're working on the characters. You know, we're doing this and, and bringing this to the uh, to TV. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So give it a chance. And that was my main thing. But I think that we did a great job. I was very happy with it, with what we did. Um, because I know that it, it, it touched a lot of people's lives because people don't know all the fan mail that we get on, even from uh, from the straight community. Of, exactly. Uh, friends have hit me up and said, you know, that our show helped them understand their kids coming out to them. So that's okay. when we knew that we were doing good work regardless of exactly they felt or they they wish that it was this or that, and you know, and where all the thuggy boys and all, you know, it was just a lot of things, but it was really about our set of friends. And what Dig we- it. Exactly. Okay, exactly. And I thank you for that. I am down to, I, this countdown is like to my last 20 seconds of the show. See, that was so quick. It's so quick. And let me say thank you for coming on. Tell Chrissy, Chrissy, darling, thank you, sugar. That's uh, 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 Rodney's manager, y'all, one of his uh, production assistants that helped me put all this together. So let me say thank you for coming on the show and dishing your tea with me, honey. Uh, For those of you who are listening, join us next week, sugar, okay? Indeed, uh, um, I want to thank, again, I just want to thank all the fans for all their support and supporting uh, the show and supporting me and sticking by me. And if you want to want to book me, D, you've got all my information. Make sure you let me All right. Uh, trust, I will, and they can always catch this because this is going to be in the archives forever, so anybody can come back and listen. I'm going to put it up on your page, too. Okay, baby. So uh, that there is that, so I will talk with you soon, darling. Thank you so much for your time. Okay, thank you so much for having me on the show. And um, you're welcome, boo. We finally got it all worked out because we've been trying. To exactly. Do Hello. <laughs> okay, baby. Okay. Thank all you. All right. So thank you. Uh huh. Bye bye. All right, ladies and gentlemen, honey, did you enjoy that? I hope you did. It had. We had a wonderful time here. Oh, you got a double dose of tea, honey. A double dose of tea. Whoo! Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. Yes. Now, honey, I want you to join me next week as we're going to continue to do this. Um, I'm waiting to make sure that this is clear because I believe I'm going to have Sinbad on next week. But if not, if I don't have him, that means that we didn't get the official clearance. I'm saying yes because they said yes. But I need to get it official. But in any event, join us again next week, and we will continue to move forward, and we will continue to dish tea. If you love me, tell a friend. If you didn't love me and hated it, tell an enemy, honey. But one thing is for sure, this thing will move forward, okay? So with that being said, my darlings, I appreciate you. I adore you. I love you, and I wish you all the very, very best. So until next week, honey, continue to dish tea with Big Beach. I'll talk with you soon. Ciao.